Welcome to another Five in Five. We're here in the windy and very sunny uh, southeast of Ireland on the South Wexford coast. Today we're going to be in dune systems and I want to try and talk to you about the genetic variation that occurs within every plant species and how some of that genetic variation is particularly useful to us. This plant is, is wild asparagus, obviously very closely related to the asparagus that we eat, uh, but it's quite different. It grows prostrate. It's, it's a flattened stem rather than an upright stem. There are some other um, subtle differences. This one has much larger fruit here than the, the cultivated asparagus, but it's very much a plant of coastal areas of northwest Europe. It occurs from Spain through France, Britain and Ireland, round to Belgium and the Netherlands and Germany. But in Ireland, we have one of the largest populations of this plant globally. So it, it's important for us nationally to keep monitoring this, this species. It's actually endangered in Ireland, and that's, that threat uh, comes from coastal development, development of dune systems. Um, whether the differences that are genetically determined merit it being called a separate species, I think is open to debate. Some people think it should be a variety or a subspecies. Others say it should be a full species. I'm a little ambivalent about it. Um, the differences aren't very great to me, but we do tend to focus our conservation priorities at the species level rather than the variety or subspecies level. So maybe this plant gets a little bit more protection if it's recognized as a full species. And that would be very important, not only for the plant, but also the habitat in which it grows in. As part of the conservation effort, we've collected seed from this population and several others within Ireland, and we store those deeply frozen in the Irish threatened plant gene bank that's held at Trinity College Botanic Garden. And that's really an insurance policy in case this species gets further uh, threatened and perhaps eventually becomes extinct in the wild. We've got some material to reintroduce this species. Plant here is wild carrot, the ancestral form of our cultivated carrot. Uh, if you go trying to collect wild food from this plant, you're not really going to find very much. It's got very skinny roots. They're not very sweet. And what we think happened uh, in the origin of, of uh, cultivated carrot is this pro probably grew as a weed in fields in Afghanistan and Iraq. And the cultivators eventually selected parts of the genetic variation of this plant, which, which produced traits such as a thicker rootstock, a sweeter rootstock, and that became the origin of our carrot. It's a plant that's uh, distributed by seed. You can see the seed heads here, um, and the seed on this is, is very small, but it's got very small little burrs on the edge and it probably gets dispersed by clinging to animals uh, and indeed um, farmers' uh, socks. And that's how this plant gets distributed. If we think about the genetic variation in plants, things that can be useful to us in, in the crop wild relatives like the carrot, where we've got genes for uh, disease resistance, pest resistance. It's very difficult to show you those, but we can show you genetic variation in this plant. And this is just common uh, ragwort, a pest of uh, agricultural fields. But this form tends to occur in coastal areas. And normally, these flower heads would have rays around them, like the rays of a sun, specialized flowers around the edge of this uh, flower head. This form genetically lacks those flowers. So it's a very distinct form, part of the genetic variation in the whole of the, the ragwort plant, but it's more or less restricted to these coastal sandy areas. Some of the most extreme genetic variation in plants, or lack of it, occurs in blackberries, uh, the genus Rubus. And that's because most of the fruits, you can see fruits here, they're not, re they're not formed by sexual reproduction. And that means that most blackberries that we see are actually genetic clones of one another. They look very variable. Um, they're incredibly difficult to identify. Uh, and naming them is, is very difficult. It's a specialist task. One that we can name, though, is this one here, which is uh, Rubus caseus, the dewberry. It's got 
stems with very small prickles. The flowers often, this one doesn't particularly, but it, they usually have uh, ragged looking petals. And the fruits are usually got a, 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 a kind of whitish bloom on them. So they look a rather different shade to most blackberries, but you will find blackberries which look extremely dif different from one another. The, the ones in, in your garden and ones in your neighbor's garden may well be, be very, very different. The only one of them that's easy to identify is this one, Rubus Kesius. This small little plant here has some interesting um, genetic variation within the natural populations. This is red Bartsia or Odontites vernus, and vernus refers to vernal or spring flowering, but here it's misbehaving, it's flowering in autumn. And there are genetically distinct populations which flower in spring and which flower in late summer and autumn. It's a member of the broomrape family and many of this family are parasites or hemiparasites. They get quite a lot of their nutrients, in this case, from the grasses that you see growing around it. And that weakens the grasses, and it can allow other species to uh, invade the grass sward. And we can exploit that. We can exploit that genetic variation in a novel way in a rather new wildflower lawns. So if we have the spring flowering form of this species and the late summer autumn flowering form, we can weaken the grasses, but we can still get a, a midsummer cut of that grass in. So genetic variation that can be exploited in a rather novel way.